Let me cover the unmade bed by shifting over. <laughs> well, all right. So I think we we should be live here. So um, this is uh, part of my occasional discussion series with interesting folk, and uh, we have part two with a very interesting person, Greg Chaitin, here. And uh, I've known Greg for a long time, and I was I was realizing I just went downstairs to my library and, and collected some. Chaitanography, so to speak. So this is this is. Uh, I don't know how much. I don't know how complete this chaitanography is, but um, there's a there's um, at least some of um, Greg's productions. In um, there seems to be a theme. It's it's either it's Gödel Turing, it's it's randomness, it's mathematics, it's meta mathematics. Those those seem to be the main themes, and uh, along with biology nowadays. Right. Right. The, so. You know, we were talking last time a little bit about this idea of sort of metabiology and the idea there's always more things for biology to discover. And um, I'm, I'm curious, have you thought about that in relation to economics as well? Or is this? Well, I, I know nothing about economics. So, um, so the answer is no, I haven't. Um, Fair enough. But um, the, the, the original... My original idea was, instead of looking at Gödel incompleteness as something pessimistic, you look at it as saying that mathematics is an open system and there's always new principles to discover. And then I was wondering if this could be turned into uh, a sort of a abstract model of evolution. And the idea would be then that Gödel's incompleteness theorem would turn into something like um, there'll be unlimited uh, progress eventually if you do random mutations. So it's... Um, I guess one of the questions that I have about the yeah. unlimited discovery concept is, yeah. you know, insofar as humans are the consumers, for example, which is not true of evolution, but is, is there an infinite amount of stuff that we will care about to discover? And put in terms of evolution, is there an infinite amount that matters in terms of being fit for life on Earth that can be discovered? Well, those are very good questions. Um, I'm at the other end of the spectrum because the normal view of evolution is that you want to adapt to the environment. If the envi uh, and once you're perfectly adapted, you stop evolving. And the only thing that drives speciation is if there's a substantial change in the environment, like change of climate, right. volcanoes, asteroids. So, so in that case, evolution stagnates once you're perfectly adjusted to the environment. So with the pr approach that I like, it's just unlimited creativity because it becomes like Gödel's incompleteness. There are no closed system. And... Um, um, well, so, so I'm curious, you know, in, in this, th that theory is, it's always a transient. You never get to the best state. Exactly. But I guess one question would be, with that point of view, is there anything universal that can be said about the, the rate of you know, improvement? I mean, you know, biology and lots of other fields are full of power laws and things like that. I mean, I'm curious, is there, can you say, uh, you know, is there any way of saying how close you got? So you say, it's, there was always room for growth. But is there room for growth in the sense that, for example, it's like busy beaver, uh, you know, Turing machines, where, it, you know, where there is room for growth, there is always a fast, you know, there is always a longer busy beaver, but it right. may be increasingly ridiculously difficult to find. I'm just sort of curious whether there's a way that you could think about characterizing in a, in a sort of stationary environment, can you characterize, you know, how close do you get? Yeah, well, in my little toy model, you can make some statements about the speed of evolution. I have only a single software organism uh, subjected to random mutations, and you need an oracle to tell you if the mutation gave you a better organism, a fitter organism, because it might give you an organism that never halts, and then it has no fitness. The fitness of my organisms is the number it calculates. So it's a busy beaver. So the bigger the number, the fitter the organism. But if you make a random change in a program, it's also possible that the program no longer calculates anything and goes on forever. So you need an oracle to tell you if the result of the random mutation uh, is an organism which is more fit. More fit. So the oracle course actually corresponds, as my wife pointed out to me, to the environment. 
It's a source of new information coming in, which in normal evolution is the environment that you get information from. Right. And except that in my case, it's an infinite amount of potential information because an oracle has... Uh, yeah, right. Although it's not obvious the environment isn't also an infinite amount of infinite source of information. Well, in, in, in reality, it's probably not an infinite amount, right? But in the real world. Right. So I don't know. There's this interesting question of, um, you were asking a very deep question. Uh, do we eventually stagnate because we've gotten close to the optimum possible organism? Or do we go on forever? I, I personally would hope that we don't stagnate. Because I don't think stagnation is good for um, yeah, well, right. people, right? That's why Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, right? He thinks if we stay here, we're going to stagnate. So you always have to have new challenges and new growth. And I, it gives us something for our children and our grandchildren to do, right? Otherwise, you get to a final theory, and then what do you do? You die of boredom or you... We well, I think, I think we both realize, I mean, for me, it's the sort of computational irreducibility idea for you, it's more the kind of uh, the, the basically equivalent idea of Gödel's theorem and so on. I mean, I think it is very clear that you know the computational paradigm shows us there is always there are always more things to discover. The right. the question is, are there more things to discover that matter for given the environment or given humans and what humans care about? It is you know there's a coevolution presumably of what humans care about and what we can discover. That is humans wouldn't have cared about TikTok or something until TikTok had been invented. And, you know, in, in um, I don't know what, to, well, they wouldn't have cared about, you know, a variety of kinds of things until, until something had been invented. And then you build on top of that and you keep going. It's true. On the other hand, talking about human psychology, uh, maybe you've noticed that in your children or in teenagers, um, they like to invent their own language they don't like to do what their parents did every generation seems to want to recreate human society in, in their own image so that suggests that um, things are going to keep changing right that uh, well except that then it turns out of course that the human condition hasn't you know to date the human condition has changed little over the course of recorded history i mean you know you go watch a, a greek play and it could be something that had been written you know uh, about absolutely modern times. Very I mean, true. Or a letter in ancient Sumer from uh, uh, a son to his father about yeah, his right. studies or something. Uh, it sounds pretty much contemporary, right? Right. Yeah, humans but, haven't changed that much. But so, so I'm curious, in terms of, uh, in your model of evolution, why are you choosing to make the fitness be based on infinite time behavior? Why not just say, if the beavers haven't built their dam in a day, we don't care what they're going to do. So to yeah, speak. well, there's a reason, which is if you want to simulate, do a computer experiment simulating evolution, you want, you want to limit the time, right? Otherwise, yes. Yeah. So that's, but I'm not interested in a, a, a simulated evolution. I mean, yes, it, I'm interested, but what I'm more interested in because it's my specialty is trying to prove theorems. So to try to, try to prove theorems, the simplest, you know, the more you complicate the model, the, the, you fall off a cliff Indeed, at some point yeah, about right. the possibility of proving theorems. So I had to keep my model very, very, very simple. And the simplest model uh, doesn't involve any time limits because the time limit complicates things, at least to me, it seemed that way. So I was trying to keep it as simple as I could. But, uh, but so, I mean, because, because one my thing goal you could is imagine to prove theorems about evolution. Right. I mean, you could imagine saying, I run a Turing machine for uh, T steps and um, kind of that's, um, uh, and then I say it, you know, it writes a number, you know, N, N things on its tape. And now you're asking the question, well, I, I guess you're, so, so one question I would have is in your Turing machine world, do your Turing machines have a fixed number of, of uh, states and colors? Because no. then there's a finite, no. So you can, you can expand that. So you can right. That's how you get unending evolution. Now, by the way, I had one uh, PhD student in Brazil. His name is uh, Felipe Abraham, and he's been publishing a series of very interesting papers now with Hector Zanil, who's better known internationally. And 
Felipe for his PhD thesis on his own, got rid of the infinite time oracle. He made a, a finite version. The times may be rather large, but they are limited. And he gets a similar kind of, it's more complicated than my theory, but he, he gets everything to sort of work in this, 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 this more reasonable uh, context. So, so, yeah, so he would be a good person to, to talk to. Right. So, so I'm curious, the phenomenon of speciation, do you yeah. understand that on the basis of your model? Well, there, is a, there was a, a wonderful biologist called Lee Van Valen, and his best paper, he had to self-publish because it was rejected by all the journals. He and, That's a good sign. That sounds pretty familiar, right? Um, and the, this new principle of evolution is sort of that you have to keep running as fast as you can to say, stay in the same place. He pointed out that you don't need climate change or geological catastrophes to drive speciation because he said, you're in an ecology, right? So there are the animals that eat you, there are the animals that you eat, and every one of them is mutating. So you have to run as fast as you can to still be able to stay in the same place, right? And so that there is an inherent uh, drive to greater complexity and to, uh, shall we say evolutionary progress? I don't know. The progress is saying, is it good or is it bad? Maybe that's not the appropriate word to use, but there's certainly a drive to uh, increasing complexity um, that's well, inherent. So wait, wait a minute, let, let me, let me stop on external... And let me challenge that claim, okay? Okay. The, so, I mean, you know, I think we both know that the last sentence of Darwin's Origin of Species talks about the concept that, you know, just like the, the Earth goes around the sun according to the law of gravity, so organisms evermore, I forget what word he used. I don't think he used complex, but he used a word like complex. You know, it's a very well, beautiful final paragraph. It's very uh, the writing. Right, but, but so he's he's positing there that there is a global law of evolution that leads to increase in complexity. Well, but, he's talking about the the creation of life. I think in the last sentence, and maybe he points out that now uh, it wouldn't work. Um, I don't remember. It's, no, I, I think I think he really is is pointing the idea that I think he believed which was life always gets more complicated. And okay, I, well, terrific. I, but I think that um, my question is, is this, yeah. I mean, you know, if, uh, if that nasty little virus had taken over the world, it's arguably considerably simpler than us humans. And is it obvious that the fittest organism, you know, you, you're making the claim, your theory is essentially making the claim that the fitter organism uh, you know, as you explore the space of Turing machines or space of organisms, right, that which is you'll be a winner. Which is what's, what's that? The... the space of all possible organisms is the space, in my model, of all, all computer programs for a universal Turing machine. Right. So that's a very rich space. I thought that was a rich enough space to model biological evolution. You but see. my question would be, is it obvious? I mean, so if you're in that space and you're always trying to be the winner, so to speak, then there is a certain argument that you're going to diffuse outwards in that space and you're always going to end up with more complicated programs. Right. But is it not, you know, is it obvious that, I mean, I guess it depends on your oracle, it depends on your environment, it depends on what kind of fitness you are looking for. I mean, I think maybe you have an argument now that is the argument that Darwin should have been looking for, for the fact that there is increasing complexity on the grounds that, the, you know, that... that if you're going to win against yourself, so to speak, mm -hmm. then you, you know, could you go to a simpler Turing machine and win against yourself? Uh, well, you know, in my model, the Oracle is an Oracle for the halting problem. So that has an infinite amount of information about the halting problem, right? And um, so the evolution is going to be open-ended. Um, now, I think in real biology, my impression is that Lee Van Valen's argument that it's called the red queen, I think, or the white yeah. queen, you have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. I think that's the best argument of an inherent drive to increased complexity, um, not coming from uh, environmental uh, change uh, that forces uh, evolution. 
the drive. So it's an intrinsic drive to, to evolution rather than an extrinsic drive. And I think he's right. He called it a, a new principle of evolution. And in, in my impression, it is a fundamental new principle. It's, it's like an arms race. You have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place because you're part of an ecology. That's in real biology. Now, in my model, I only have one organism at a time. So you don't have, it's only competing with, with itself, so to speak. So, but in, in you get on limited evolution for another, for other, for different reasons. But it seems to me that in real biology, Lee Van Valen hit the nail on the head, at least. Uh, but so, my so to challenge, to challenge that a little bit from technology, okay? okay? Something you've been involved in, the risk architecture idea, you know, reduced okay. construction set architecture, right? Yes. In a sense, is that not an example of where it was, you know, the fitter computers were ones that actually had a simpler instruction set. Well, it was certainly, uh, it would be faster if you could get the whole processor on one chip, you avoided um, chip crossings and therefore your, your processor cycle could be, uh, right. could be shorter. But, that was the idea that, that simplicity might be a good idea, but the simplicity moved to a different place. It moved to the, comp the complexity moved to a different place. It moved to the compiler, which is sort of like a compiler for microcode, because it, this is a microcode machine, the RISC team, right? It has a very simple right. instruction set. So you need a better compiler. You need an optimizing compiler that, that, that does more work than a normal compiler because you're taking the high level language and going down to a lower level machine language than is usual. But it's one that if you do it right, will execute very fast at roughly one instruction per cycle. In, in principle, that would be the best you could do. But, but so I want to compare that with biology because I mean, you know, we, you know, is there a, a risk biology, so to speak? That is, is it the case? I mean, for example, yeah. one of the- Okay, well, I'll argue, yeah, I, good question. Listen, uh, I think that we can see uh, that the increase of complexity, societies, organizations, bureaucracies, corporations tend to get more and more bureaucratic with more rules and regulations uh, until basically they, they collapse. And a, a more dynamic, a smaller, a startup, another, another nation which doesn't have such a big bureaucracy, doesn't have so many rules and regulations about things, um, you know, can shoot past them. And I think we see that uh, I think we see that in international politics, unfortunately. I think I've seen it in uh, the corporate history. Um, so, so I think that's an example, as you say, where increased complexity gets to a point where a society is too top heavy, the bureaucracy is too big, they become too inert, and, and this, they can't innovate, they can't adapt to changes in the environment, in the international environment, in the global warming changes. So whereas a smaller organization, a, a nation which is younger or maybe doesn't have so many laws and rules and regulations that um, is more like a startup and is able to quickly adapt to new circumstances and probably will replace the older, more bureaucratic society. So, so I'm not saying that complexity per se is, is wonderful because there's certainly complexity which is, uh, which is bad right? Uh, so it's not that complexity is a virtue. It's just that if you keep adding new ideas to an organism, um, to biology, the complexity increases, but it doesn't mean that every increase in complexity is beneficial. It's not. Right. Definitely. Well, I mean, we see that in the fossil record. I mean, you know, there are trilobites with all kinds of ornate bits and pieces, and then those disappear. Um, right. And, but, but I guess I'm, I'm curious in, in modeling that, you know, if you the this okay so there are a couple of possible models i mean if you have a turing machine for example that has enough possible uh rules that you'll never you know in practice you'll never reach the edge of that that's a little different from saying i mean to me i'm, I'm trying to understand you know if you say okay if the criterion is be the best busy beaver you can write down as many symbols um, before halting as you can as soon as you've run out of, so, so the claim would be- That's actually, my this simple is, model, yeah. I have I mean, another model where you want, to, you want to calculate a constructive ordinal number. That's sort of a, 
more abstract version of the busy beaver. Instead of getting the biggest possible positive integer, you want the biggest possible constructive ordinal. It's sort of a mathematically, it's a it's a pretty topic. Uh, I'm so, sorry, I interrupted you. No, yeah. no, no. I, I, I wanted to I want to chase that one also. But but okay. my first question would be, you know, busy beaver, the busy beaver function of two or something is, I don't know, five or whatever. The busy beaver function of a, you know, as you increase the number of states in the Turing machine, the busy beaver function, so far as I know, always increases. Uh, and, and maybe that's obvious. It's not totally obvious to me why the busy beaver function, why there isn't, why there couldn't be a Turing machine with five states that is the all-time busy beaver winner. Is that for obvious that states. that can't happen? For five states. What's but that? The, for five states, there is a... Uh, Absolutely. There, sure. But if, you, if the number of states isn't limited, um, the busy beaver function grows as, as a function of the number of states in the Turing machine grows faster than any computable function. So... Right. Uh, okay. So, so, so the argument. Would you give me a Turing machine and, and and you can construct from it a um, one that does well? You need you need you need an oracle for the halting problem to make fun. You know, you can always take a Turing machine and add one to its output, right? So that's a little better. But um, using an oracle for the halting problem, you can really shoot up enormously in the values that you. Um, that you can calculate with a Turing machine, but to get those a series of Turing machines that where the numbers they calculate grow really fast. Um, um, well, in practice, people right. I mean, in practice, the actual you know champion busy beavers of different sizes have a couple of features. I mean, one is I don't believe that they are you know the busy beaver for m plus one doesn't seem to have much relation to the busy beaver for N in practice when people you know, find the actual busy beavers. That's one thing. The other thing is when you look at those busy beaver functions, they or busy beaver Turing machines, they tend to be incredibly systematic looking. Like they're gradually counting up, counting down, counting this, that, and the other. And they do it in a very kind of, in a way that sort of eventually, you know, has systematically taken a long time. Well, but the re reason there's no relationship between the winner for BBN and BBN plus one is because you're adding new information. Look, maybe it's better than instead of talking the busy beaver function. Another way to formulate what my little model is doing is the organisms are learning more and more bits of the halting probability omega. It's sort of equivalent. That's sort of equivalent to doing well on the busy beaver function. It's, it, I, it's just a slightly different way of dressing it up. Well, so, so by saying that, what you're saying is, as they add more bits, of the no, as, as, they, as, they, as they can, what is it? As they, as they explore the space more, they're getting a better estimate of omega. They're getting right? a better and better lower bound that has an initial number of bits that's correct, uh, that, that's greater and greater. That's, that's because they know that they already halted, but they, they know those ones already halted. Is that right? That's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lower then, bounds on omega are computable. You just don't know how close you are, but you can get better and better lower bounds without knowing how close you are to the final value. In other words, you you can get you can calculate the halting probability in the limit from below, but there's no computable regulator of convergence. You don't know how far out to go to get the first n bits right because it grows faster than well, it grows like busy beaver function of n to get the first n bits right. You know, so it converges right. very, very slowly is another way to put it, uncomputably slowly. But, but it, the halting probability is computable in the limit from below in a weak sense. Normally you demand given an epsilon, uh, you know, calculated to within epsilon. You can't do that, but you can get better and better lower bounds that in the limit um, do tend to the halting probability. Right. So that's a weaker sense of convergence uh, than the so normal. And so, yeah. so, so now I'm, I'm curious about your computable ordinals. So by that, do you mean that you're computing, I don't know, you know, lowercase omega to the omega to the omega, you know, you, by, by, by computable ordinals, do you mean constructing one of those kind of Cantor kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, is a, there is a lovely 
theory, well, uh, ordinal numbers are, are very beautiful. They, they come in a list, right? One, two, three, omega, omega plus one, omega plus two, two omega, three omega, omega squared, omega to the omega, omega to the omega, omega. It's a very beautiful hierarchy. And there's a notion that tries to make it a little less theological, which is a constructive ordinal. And that's one where you actually can calculate uh, a limit sequence that gives you the ordinal in the limit. So it's a constructive notion of an ordinal. And um, of course, most of the ordinals that people talk about are constructive ordinals, right? The ones I, all the ones I mentioned are, are that way. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful mathematical structure and it's a little richer than, um, than one, two, three, four, five and getting the biggest number, but it's sort of similar because it's an extension of one, two, three, four, five. The ordinals are but, extended. But so as I understand it, I mean, by the time you've got the limit of omega to the omega to the omega, whatever, which becomes epsilon zero and, and so on, right. you, you've got a series of named limits that you reach. Right, right. And, and, but when you it's say constructive patient. ordinals, do you mean ones that are sort of within that named collection? Because you can, you can go on forever. You can have an infinite number of names. Yes, you, you can go on forever, but you're demanding that there should always be a, um, a, 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 an algorithm to, to, to get it, uh, to get your, an ordinal in the limit from below that makes it a constructive ordinal. There are, there are non-constructive ordinals uh, because you can, uh, you can take, yeah. Well, the constructive ordinals are um, all have names, so th th it's only going to be a discrete infinity. It's only going to be uh, it's a, it's going to be uh, Aleph sub zero possibilities for constructive ordinals. But there are ordinals for every cardinal number, no matter how big. Uh, there's you know usually you you write them as Aleph with a ordinal as a subscript. And that's all the, uh, the all the cardinalities that depends on some assumptions. But anyway, so for enormously big olives, which are totally non-constructive, you know, very theological looking, uh, Cantor's imagination, there correspond very non-constructive ordinals. And this is this is set theory, which is a, a fantasy. It's like theology, but there are constructive versions, which are more down to earth. Like the constructive ordinals was a chapter. I think it's a lovely chapter in. Um, in recursive function theory, it used to be called, and maybe now it's called computability theory. Uh, uh -huh. But but so uh, okay, so there are a bunch of things. I, I I I it's amusing you say you know set theory is a fiction. I want to talk about that because I know you you consider yourself a Platonist, and I think you know if well, you're a Platonist, you know th those those have to be Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> right. But, but, we may both be Platonists, but we feel a strong attraction to the notion of computability, right? And what can be programmed. So um, I don't think those are necessarily incompatible ideas. I mean, I think that, you know, okay. you know, the, in, in my kind of view of things, you know, this thing I'm calling the Ruliad, which is this kind of, which is something sort of related, I think. I mean, and I'd like to understand more about its relation to the whole Omega story. But, but just back, back to the constructive ordinals for a second. I'm just curious. In, in this idea where, you know, you reach a point where, you know, you have the name epsilon zero, I think you have some names like kappas and so on. I don't know what, you know, people have chosen different names for things, right? I don't quite understand. And how should I understand the process of needing to get to a new name? And why can't I just pick, you know, uh, a UUI, you know, why can't I just pick an integer? Why can't I just index the successive things for which I need new names? Well, the name for a constructive ordinal is an algorithm that calculates a, a limit sequence a, yep. that gets, gets you that constructive ordinal in the limit. And that becomes the name. And um, this gives you a way of, these are not very maybe friendly names, but... Um, uh, so you can hash the computation. You could say, here's the program. I'm going to use the program as the name or a hash of the program right. as the name. Right, right. Okay, so listen, um, it's true. I I feel Platonist some of the time. I think to be a pure mathematician, there is an aspect of your personality which 
one can't speak for all mathematicians, but there's a platonic. Gödel said that uh, pure mathematicians are the last um, holdouts of the theology of the Middle Ages, you know, because they believe in the platonic world of mathematical ideas and philosophers think the platonic world of ideas is, is you know, passé, super passé, right? But pure mathematicians in a way are still inhabiting that world. And for Gödel, I guess it, it meant the whole package from the Middle Ages because he was also uh, a believer. Um, he uh, believed in God. And um, what, what was his version of God? I mean, I know he had a sort of logical argument, which was similar to the ontological argument for, for God, yeah. but what was, his, what was his kind of view of God? Was it a kind of Spinoza-like view of, you know, God is everything kind of thing? Or was it, a, was it something different? The most perfect of all possible beings. Uh, and I think his argument is that uh, existence... Uh, it would be more perfect if he existed than if he didn't exist, so therefore he exists. Was that the argument? Something like that. I think so. I mean, that, that but, but so. These are, all, these are old arguments. But the, the point of the, math, of the platonic world of ideas is, is very simple. You say one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Well, that's already infinity, you know, and in our human experiences, we don't see anything that's, well, that's infinite. The notion of God may be infinite, but one, two, three, four, five going on forever doesn't fit in the physical universe, right? It doesn't fit on earth. You can't write all those numbers down. It is already a big leap into the unknown, into theology, I would, wouldn't say necessarily, but a leap of the imagination, because if you limit yourself to a finite number of numbers, the structure mathematically is sort of ugly. So it mathematically it's more beautiful to say that the one, two, three, four, five goes on forever. That has a more beautiful structure and you can prove th theorems about it. So but, but, this is but, how you pure mathematics. On the other hand, if, if, the, if you know, the halting probability omega, if you say that it only thinks that there's a so an algorithm for it exist, well, it's not a computable real number. So therefore you're gonna say the halting probability omega doesn't exist. So the whole thing probability omega is already some, in some sense in the platonic world of ideas. It's not a number like square root of two or pi that we can calculate as accurately as we want, but it's just over the limit. So what makes it interesting to me is that this is something that almost looks like you can calculate it because in fact, there's even a limit sequence that's computable, but you just, it just converges incredibly slowly. So it's interesting because it's interesting to try to find the border between what can be computed and what human beings can in principle do if they had unlimited time for computations, but finite always. And the full richness of say mathematical analysis, the real numbers, uh, you know, already the real numbers are very unreal actually. There aren't enough names for every real number that, because all possible names or all possible programs is a denumerable infinity and the real numbers are a non-denumerable infinity. So, that's already a fantastic piece of work that is due to Cantor to point out that these infinities are different, right? And then there's the question, is there anything in the middle, which is a, a sticking point? For... What do you think? What Do you think the continuum hypothesis, I mean, if you're a Platonist, you believe in the, the, the do you have, do you, do you think the continuum hypothesis is in some real sense true, false, what? Um, I think the idea is, the continuum hypothesis, I'm not a set theorist, right? But my impression as an outsider is that it's more beautiful. You know, I, aesthetics, as my wife pointed out to me, uh, aesthetic criteria for truth. It's a question of beauty. So what is more beautiful if the continuum hypothesis is true or if the continuum hypothesis is false? Well, I think it's simpler and more beautiful if the continuum hypothesis is true because then we know the structure and it, it's... Mm -hmm it makes a certain amount of sense. Now you can construct pathological examples, right? Where the continuum hypothesis is false and you get a, a, a wild, uh, lots of wild things going on. Those are very interesting from some points of view, but, but it seems to me that there's an argument in taking the simplest uh, view of, uh, of uh, Cantor's theory of infinities, which was the view that Cantor had, I would, argue that as a possible argument. Now, this is not my field and the people in the, 
who actually work on set theory. There, you know, there's maybe 30 people who Sharon Shalab, for example, is one of the right. great set the theorists. The set of set theorists is not a large set. It's beautifully put. So these are incredibly bright people like uh, Bob Solovey, uh, that I used to talk to about these things. They're incredibly bright people, and you know they have a right to decide how the universe is that they that they work on, right? So I don't. We would have to ask one of them. I know they've added new axioms to projective determinacy. I think has been added by th that small community has decided that after thirty years of work, it's obvious that this new principle should be added to the axioms of set theory. It only took thirty years of work by some of the brightest people on planet Earth to say it's obvious that this principle makes set well, theory. Well, so, so I have two questions there. I mean, you know, one is obviously there's a risk instruction set approach to mathematics that one can imagine. Given right. the things that you want to have be true, what's the best axiom system to get there? Absolutely. And if we want to teach mathematics and we want to tell people that mathematics is beautiful, um, um, well, but you've, you know, you've discovered a, what is it, a one-line axiom for Boolean algebra, right, for propositional yeah. calculus. Yeah. And it's only one axiom, but it's a very unintuitive axiom for a human being. Absolutely. Right? Right. Yeah, you, you found it, but yeah, right. Well, I, a computer found it for me, so to speak. Right. right. Well, okay. But... <laughs> it's um, I, I was just the computer wrangler. Well, um, it's it's uh, it, the computer is your disciple, so to speak, when it does this. Right. You know that one thing that's interesting about that result, to my mm -hmm. knowledge, it is the only unexpected mathematical result ever derived by automated theorem proving. All other results derived by automated theorem proving were things that people kind of already kind of knew were out there. So I, I you know sort of an interesting fact. I mean, in terms of random facts of mathematics, as found by automated theorem proving, yeah, most yeah. random facts of mathematics, people don't have frameworks for and don't care about. This is, um, and this one's probably on the edge, but but coming back to the continuum hypothesis for a second, I mean, in, um, okay. uh, what is the, what is your understanding? Do, do you know of a connection between sort of computability theory and the continuum hypothesis? I mean, a clean way to say, like in terms of Turing machines, what is the continuum hypothesis? Or is it, is it only something that's stated in terms of set theory? Or is there some relationship between kind of oracles and you know, thinking about real numbers as oracles and, and you know, uh, integers as, as computable numbers, things like that? Is there some way of understanding the continuum hypothesis as a, as a sort of absence of some kind of intermediate oracle or something? Or is it, uh, what's that relationship? Well, that's a good question. Um, listen, once you write a formal axiomatic theory, for example, zermelo frankel set theory, um, it becomes a constructive question to ask if something is a theorem or not, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a program that holds or doesn't deriving all consequence of the axioms. So it might be possible. So the question of whether you can prove that there is an infinity between um, the infinity of the whole numbers and the infinity of the continuum, uh, that is a question that is a concrete question because it corresponds to a computation. But you see, we're already, we have to, we're dealing now with a set of axioms for something. We're not dealing with the platonic world of set theory, whatever that is. But, but so wait a minute, you're saying that if I have in, in a Hilbert type sense, Given the axioms of set theory, I go and I just start generating all the theorems of set theory. Right. And you're saying it might be the case then that in if I just start enumerating the theorems of set theory, that one of those theorems would be up. Oh, there's that. Well, you know, there is an infinity, or there is no infinity between the Aleph sub zero and uh, the continuum C. Right. But, but I thought that the independence of the continuum hypothesis doesn't that show that that you won't ever reach it as a, as a just mechanically deriving it from ZFC? Or ZF rather? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's a, a relative result. What the result says, there could be a contradiction in ZF. I don't know if that's possible. I but see, I see. If, if there isn't one introducing the continuum hypothesis does not add a contradiction and there's sort of the opposite. Uh, but so, 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 but, but so, what is the answer? I mean, if we mechanically, if we take ZF and we mechanically generate all the theorems of ZF. Well, it wouldn't necessarily be ZF. Um, that happens to be one set of axioms for set theory. I think that set, practicing set theorists at this moment, 
hub and rich CF with, I think it's called projective determinacy. And I think the community agrees that the resulting structure is more beautiful and it enables them, it enables them to prove uh, there were some articles by what was the name of that set theory and the notice set theorist and the notices of the American maybe, maybe Hugh Wooden he's been a person yeah been this, this he stuff. wrote two two beautiful papers on this and it, some things that people conjectured but were not able to prove you can prove by adding projective determinacy but you cannot settle the continuum hypothesis yet he points out so right. um, so this is this is tough stuff and um, but, but let's come back to the philosophy of this and and you know in i mean okay so you know i have a definite point of view that's actually been developing just over the last few weeks or months okay and, great. Um, actually amusingly my my wife has been telling me for 25 years that uh, this axiomatic pursuit of mathematics is just the wrong direction i uh-huh. mean she's you know a pure mathematician so so you know for uh-huh. her it's it's um, uh, perhaps she has a certain uh, you know tendency as you've described it towards the aesthetic Platonistic view of mathematics. But, but the most um, beautiful, what's real is what's most beautiful, shall we say? Right. Yes. Well, that, I I I need to understand that better. I mean, I, you know that that's been because that's a that's a type of thing. Let's talk about that for a second. I mean, you know, in physics, for example, there's the question of is the simplest theory the right theory, and in you know, in, I don't know, lots of fields, there, there's the, it's kind of the Occam's razor is the simplest theory, the right theory. Is your making the assertion that, I mean, can, can you unpack this question about whether the right, in some sense, the best mathematics is the most beautiful mathematics, but beauty is, isn't that very much in the eye of the beholder? And, and how does that relate to the, the thing being a real platonic thing versus just something that is in the in the eye of us as beholders. Yeah, there's a beautiful essay by Max Born, uh, Experiment in Theory in Physics. I think it was during the Second World War. It was published by Cambridge University Press. It was a lecture he gave, and he 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 decries the people who, by pure thought, are trying to get the laws of the of the universe completely by pure thought. And he says that you need hints from experiment. And this notion of aesthetics, um, that the, you know, the, the beauty of Maxwell's equations, for example, or something, this is something that it's only in retrospect. We, this notion of beauty evolved because we worked with it. And, um, and um, um, as you say, well, it's not... It's, see, uh, see, I think there's a weird difference between physics and mathematics in, in some sense. And by the way, one of the things that I've concluded recently is that physics and mathematics are fundamentally the same. And okay. I can explain that. Uh, it's, it's, I, it's not something I saw coming. It's something that I find surprising, but it's really quite interesting. And it, and it, but, and it really, I think, in a sense, proves Platonism. We can talk about what that means. Uh, ah, okay, because you're saying that all possible laws are sort of, laws of physics are sort of simultaneously occurring. Yes, but, but, well, I was going to say something about physics versus mathematics. I mean, one, one possible thing you could do in physics is you have a bunch of experiments. You, you pick, you know, you do various experiments and you make logical deductions between experiments. You just say, all we know about the world is the experiments we're doing. And we deduce from the fact we did one experiment, there must be an implication that some other experiment will come out some way. Oh, by the way, if I, if I could, talking about experiments, today, Andrea Rossi announced uh, two products. Um, he, he's been working on, um, it, it used to be called cold fusion, then it started being called low energy nuclear reactions. And now it seems that what he has, I don't know, he, he's, he's not telling people, but it looks like it's a little piece of ball lightning inside a small system. He, 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 he thinks he's getting, he has a paper on this uh, in ResearchGate. He, he thinks he's getting electricity energy uh, out of the vacuum. And he just announced two, two, two products today. Um, one, one, um, one is an LED, a light, which is equivalent to a hundred watt LED with only four watts of input. And the other generates electricity directly. And I don't know what it's, Characteristics are, I found the announcement a little cryptic, but people are going to unpack it. Uh, it was a 15 minute video. And this could conceivably be revolutionary or not. 
um, I, I gave a lecture in Mexico City about uh, what became of cold fusion. And there's actually, in Japan, there's a lot of institutional support a lot, a, yeah. for a project, yeah, which is a development uh, of um, pretty close to the original ideas of uh, Fleischmann and Pons. And there's an organization called Clean Planet. There's... Um, it always, it always seemed to me surprising. I mean, you know, palladium absorbs a lot of hydrogen. And, it's a, you know, a sponge, right. right. But you can, you can use nickel. And yeah, the original experiments were deuterium and palladium, which obviously is not going to work for a practical technology. Then it turns out you can manage with nickel and hydrogen, which is already a step in the direction of a usable technology. Anyway, in Japan, they've been working on this for years. Um, they, they don't call it cold fusion because that would be suicide. They've been calling it new hydrogen energy, and now they call it uh, quantum hydrogen energy, Q, H, capital Q, capital H, low case E. Huh. Know, it's good we hide it under It's UNED. good, yeah. Quantum is a good brand these days. Until, 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 there's the, until there are embarrassments with quantum computers, which will take a while, It'll be a good brand. Oh, right. That's, a, that's another topic. But there is a, there's a lot of institutional support in Japan. Uh, there, you can talk about this in the newspapers, in magazines. And strangely enough, no one dares to talk about this outside of Japan, even though a lot of their press releases are in English. And their really? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, I have to say, I have suspected ever since that stuff first came on the scene that there's probably something there. You know, the question right. of... And, and right, but but the environment is very messy and complicated, right? Uh, the electrochemical cell or condensed matter nuclear physics. But the new thing that 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 Rossi is doing, it looks more like ball lightning, and he thinks um, he thinks that he's he's getting energy out of the vacuum because the vacuum has an enormous energy, right? The quantum vacuum, right? Oh boy, yeah. You know, I, I wrote a paper back in like 1981 with a friend of mine about. Um, the, you know, vacuum energies and things. And somebody pointed out that uh, you could take our calculations and you could make this closed cycle that, you know, you take a box, you make it narrower, longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you go around a cycle, you could extract energy from the vacuum that way. And that was proposed as an interstellar propulsion thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, those calculations make assumptions about what you can, you know, how you can, how materials can interact with the quantum vacuum. And those assumptions are just, you know, they're just not right. Because, you know, you've, what, what's happening is you've got these, you know, extremely high frequency things going on in the vacuum. And those are, and, and an actual material is very leaky on high frequencies because it just has atoms that have a certain distance between them and so on. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know what, um, I mean, I, I think, uh, well, it'll, you know, I think one of the things that, the, the two meta points, I suppose, that are interesting about the cold fusion business. One is, you know, if there is something and it's there and the scientific establishment, so to speak, has squashed it, squashes it for 50 years, what do we conclude from that? That's right, one, right. But one it, thing. It, it's not squashing it in Japan, interestingly enough. But, but, but Andrea Rossi, another guy who's doing very interesting stuff in this area is uh, Randall Mills. And he thinks he has hydrinos, which are supposed to be hydrogen atoms with the electron closer to the proton that is possible. Yeah, I know this theory, right. Right, and it all sounds pretty crazy, except that he claims to have 22 published experiments um, with different kinds of measuring technology, uh, giving experimental evidence for the existence of these things. And one of the simplest ones that even I can understand, since I'm not a physicist, has to do with chromatography. And apparently these things diffuse too quickly, which means they're smaller than even hydrogen. Right. So, so I, I, I told some physicists in Mexico City, uh, please guys, take a look at this stuff. Uh, you know, it might, it might actually be new physics. Um, but that's a challenging thing always in these fields, right? The, the, you know, this whole, there's, it's, you know, there are ideas there, they could be interesting, but there's a main flow of the field and it's not that. And it's also- well, You know, uh, Sabin Hassenfelder has been criticizing the main flow of the field uh, very vociferously and on videos. And um, I sort of agree with her criticisms that it's um, too much is fashion. Um, um, 
Well, yeah. yes, but I, well, I don't know. I think, I think, come, uh, well, no, but I mean, the other thing is perhaps interesting. Though, I think it's wonderful the way you get general relativity and quantum mechanics coming so naturally out of your approach, right? right. The multi-way system no, is I mean, quantum I mean, mechanics and uh, that that's very beautiful that the, you know, the Feynman right. Look, I, I is think very natural the, to your right. formulation. The, the thing that has been interesting in, um, I mean, just uh, one, one last thing about cold fusion. I mean, one thing that's amusing about that is, I mean, I think you've talked a bunch about random facts of mathematics and the fact that there's always more to discover. It right. is also the case in physics. If we believe that physics is computational, the same is true of physics. That is, oh, there's terrific. always a new technology to discover. Yeah, I'm personally disappointed that it's, you know, it's already a hundred years since the biggest, uh, the big change in the last big advance in physics, I think, was arguably in the 1920s when quantum mechanics was created. Yes, that's we're, right. We're now in the 20s again. It's been a hundred years. And right. I think right. nature's imagination is greater than ours. I'm disappointed that some fundamental new well, thing at that level hasn't come up yet. Right. Well, that's why I'm excited about what we've been doing, because I, you know, I wasn't something that I was expecting was going to be possible. But it turns out, you know, it's one of these things where these all these dominoes are falling in a surprisingly you know, convincing way. But, yeah. but, but let's come back to the physics. As a priori theory, I think it's very beautiful what you've done. But, it's a whole new approach to theoretical physics that very naturally leads to, um, as, as I said, quantum mechanics and general relativity don't contradict but, uh, each other. Know, right? So I think that that's already a, a marvelous achievement. On the other hand, I think that it's good to listen to nature. So if there are anomalous experiments that are pointing to new physics, uh, you know, I think we really should take a good look. Uh, right, I mean, the challenge though, going from an underlying theory to what is experimentally accessible is itself a big challenge. And for example, that's one of the things in our project, that's one of the things that I would say, you know, there, there are many things that are like way ahead of schedule, like a hundred years ahead of schedule, so to speak, on our project. Um, in terms of particularly understanding kind of the mathematical structure of what's going on, seeing the connections to other kinds of mathematical approaches people have taken. I would say the thing that if anything is a little bit behind schedule is figuring out, okay, so are there dimension fluctuations that we can see in the early universe? Are there mm -hmm. other experimentally accessible effects? And the difficulty with those things is always, yes, we've got an underlying theory, but on top of that underlying theory, there's a big stack of practical sort of engineering-ish stuff that has to be done of, you know, just what does a photon do when it propagates through a mixture of a magnetic field and a dimension anomaly and so on. And that's, you know, that's almost, that's, that's typically a stack of traditional physics. And, you know, the, the good examples from the past, which are, I think, cautionary tales, both Newton's calculation of the, of the motion of the moon and Einstein's calculation of bending of light around the sun, well, in the case of Newton, he got the wrong answer and it took 150 years for people to get the right answer because it was just difficult math that he couldn't do. In the case of Einstein, back in, uh, uh, in 1916 or something, he had a calculation of the bending of light around the sun and there was an eclipse experiment that was being done, which got turned away because it was the beginning, you know, it was the middle of World War I. They weren't able to do the experiment. Um, and that was just as well because the calculation Einstein had done was wrong. And By a factor of two. Yeah, yeah or something. No, I mean, that was the factor of two was the big issue, right? The, it's that's the, the bending of light around the sun is a factor of two larger in, in general relativity than it is in, in, in Newtonian gravity. The, Give me just a second, please. Yeah. Sorry, there was someone knocking at the door. The, I'm sorry, I'm very uh, in the room. And I will want to zoom to make sure that I'm computer. Whether the are in our office, is there? Yeah, I'm sorry. They want to they want to clean this hotel room, and I asked them, "Can they come back in an hour?" Yeah, I'm sorry. You were you were talking well, about general relativity. Oh, yeah. Was it Eddington? And, and experimental observations, and I think that you know, this question of of okay. So so here's a here's a bizarre point for you. So in our theory of this Rouliad idea, where in a sense, all possible rules are being run. We live in a particular place in this Rouliad. We, we have a certain view of how the universe works. In a sense, we're not fully localized in Rouliad space. 
And the reason for that is inductive inference, the way we deduce what the laws of physics are from observations, isn't, it's not perfect. We, we haven't done all possible experiments. So there's still some uncertainty for us in what the laws of the universe actually are. And we can characterize that in our model by saying we are not completely localized in real space. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a version of the more experiments you do, the more localized you are, so to speak. The more experiments you do, the more you know, yes, it's these laws and not those laws that are our description of the universe. Because one of the points of this theory is that, that the description that we, you know, the, the, the main logical idea of this theory is you look at all possible, you look at the entangled effect of all possible rules. And by the way, that construct, I'm curious whether you've run across that construct. So what, what the Rouliad is, is the entangled running of all possible Turing machines. Entangled. Entangled. So what I mean by that is you start all these Turing machines off in all possible initial states. And over time, some Turing machines can end up in the same state, even though they had different rules, they had different initial conditions, just by the state could end up being the same, right? The head could be in the same place. And that leads to a structure for this whole Rouliad object. Mm. So in other words, you're looking at all possible Turing machines, you start them off from all possible states. They run forwards. You might have thought those were all on separate threads, but they're not, because many of them have you know, overlapping, you know, they have equivalences in the states they reach. And so far as I know, I mean, I, you know, I started looking at this object and I kind of was thinking somebody must have studied something like this before. But I don't know of any any Not that I mean, I'm aware of. It's a beautiful idea. Um, so, so I mean, that's the that's I'm sort of the foundation. Of that that's that's what this Rouliad thing is. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, as an observer within that Rouliad, mm -hmm. where you are also running a a bundle of rules, so to speak, you, you're you're an observer within that. And the question is, what is your conclusion about what's going on? And the big argument is, if you have the feature that you are computationally bounded and you believe that you are persistent, then essentially general relativity and quantum mechanics follow. So that's the claim. So, but, but this idea that you have, see, well, let, let's take the case of space, for example, where we think you know space is made of a bunch of atoms of space and um, uh, we're trying to, um, uh, and, and at every moment, you're sort of rewriting the structure of these atoms of space. That means that you and I, at every moment, are being made out of different atoms of space. That is, as we, as we go through time, we're, complete, we're being rewritten, right? And, and the specific atoms that we're made out of at a given moment will not be the same as the atoms we're made out of at the next moment. I mean, it's, it's much like the analogy of, you know, the vortex and the fluid or the wave and the fluid, where there's still a wave, but the molecules it's made out of are changing out all the time. So the basic claim is of, of, this, of this theory that as soon as we have the assumption that we are persistent, as soon as we believe that there is a persistent thread of existence that we have, that implies certain things about the way we view the universe. So in other words, we might say, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not persistent over time. I'm just, you know, I'm just changing over, changing out all these atoms. There's no persistence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As soon as you say there is persistence, you are defining essentially a thread of time. And that, that, that sort of sequentialization of time is what ends up leading to general relativity and so on. I mean, it, it's a, let me give an analogy, which, which perhaps is helpful. And then, then I want to... Um, the, this has to do with, could, do you conclude that the second law of thermodynamics is true? So you're looking at a gas, you've got all these molecules bouncing around. If you are a, an observer at our scale, you just say, oh, the, the, the molecules seem like they are randomly configured. But if mm -hmm. you're a Maxwell's demon down at a microscopic scale and you're watching every molecule, you won't conclude that. You'll conclude something completely different about what's going on. So in a sense, the fact that the second law of thermodynamics is what we perceive a law of physics to be is a consequence of the way that we are observing that system. Ah, oh, that's a very helpful analogy, yeah, metaphor. Right. 
and, and the claim is that basically, uh, well, the existence of space and general relativity and so on are similarly consequences of the way that we are perceiving this underlying uh, structure of, 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 of space. And so then, uh, and for example, I mean, one of the things I, I find interesting is the, the fact that motion is possible. It's not obvious motion would be possible. It's not obvious you can take an object and just move it and have it be the same object. Yeah, well, in cellular automata spaces, you can't. You know, the von Neumann 29 state model had to do self-reproduction to move the organism. Yes, right, so. right. Well, that, that kind of, I, I, you know, the, the problem with cellular automata, they are extremely useful as, as sort of conceptual models, but as models of space-time and so on, they're really not winners because they've mm -hmm. already burnt in the answer. This is what space is like. It's an array of cells. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's you want to of... get space-time emerging from a lower scale. Right, mm -hmm. because space-time, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for example, even in physics, motion is not self-evident. If you're near a, a space-time singularity, no object survives going near a space-time singularity. It's always shredded. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that, um, so, but, but um, by the way, okay, my most recent claim is the possibility of doing mathematics is a consequence of the existence of space. Let me unpack that claim. That, that claim is not, if you could figure uh, I, I'd be, you, okay. You, Euclid would love it because they used to think that geometry was the most fundamental area of, uh, of mathematics, right? Right, right. And, and maybe, okay, so, so here's the, how the logic goes. So the, the question is, if you're looking, the, the claim is that, uh, you know, underneath physics is all possible rules being run in this entangled way. And the perception that we have the physical world is a consequence of us as observers interacting with that underlying Rouliad structure. Okay, and then the claim is that underlying Rouliad structure is exactly the same for mathematics. And so when we do mathematics, we are merely observers in this Rouliad, different from the observers that we are in physics. There's sort of the notion of a mathematical observer who's sampling. I mean, imagine, just imagine all possible axiom systems and you're running all possible axiom systems and you're working out all their, all their consequences and so on. That's what this Rouliad thing is doing. It's going, to include, it's going to include that as well as things that look more like physics. Right, right. Yeah. Because the whole point is that the claim is it includes all those things. But the reason that we see physics as physics is because we are a certain kind of observer and we have certain beliefs about how we work, like this persistence through time belief. Mm -hmm. And that that's, that's how we perceive physics from this Rouliad. But if we are a different kind of observer, we will, our parsing of this Rouliad will be a mathematical parsing of this Rouliad. And we will be seeing uh, kind of, you know, and what will happen is all these microscopic things. So, so okay, so one thing, we don't have a name for this yet. We're competing. There are two competing names. I can, I can get your take on these names. The, the, um, uh, these atoms of space are just elements that have an identity. And they have these rewriting rules that apply to them. Within this Rouliad, they're, they're the lowest level entities. They're the, they're the things of which everything is made. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those things in mathematics, so in physics, that's what space is made of. In mathematics, those are the precursors of variables and operators and things like that in axiomatic mathematics. Think about them roughly, they're like, like combinators or something. Those, those entities that in the case of physics, our best sort of pictorial version of that is to think about them as nodes in a hypergraph. And physics is sort of the evolution of that hypergraph. In mathematics, the idea is there's also this low level structure. It might be combinators, it might be something else. And then the way that mathematics emerges is we see, oh, there's a cluster of these low level elements that gets repeated in this way and that way. And we can identify that with the integer two. So in other words, what we're saying is at the lowest level in physics, it's just this, you know, these all possible rules running, but, as observers in the physical world, 
we identify certain things and we call something a, an electron, for example. So the claim is that in mathematics, we're also running all these things. And the things we identify that in physics, we call an electron. In mathematics, we call it the integers or the number two or something like this. But it's mm -hmm. the same stuff underneath. It's a very bizarre point of view, but th this is the one yeah. that I've come to. But, 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 but time is of interest. There's a time evolution when you're thinking of physics. And in, in math, you sort of forget about the... Very good point. Yeah. Right. So, so here's how I think that works. So proof is like time in mathematics. So in other words, you can have just like in physics, there is a, a, a light cone, you know, something you, you have some set of objects and then you look at their entailments through time. That's your light mm -hmm. cone. Mm -hmm. In mathematics, you have some set of axioms, for example, and then you look at the proof consequences of those, and that's kind of an entailment cone that is the set of things that can be proved. So in a sense, what, what you might be saying is, given a set of axioms, for example, there is only a finite entailment cone from those axioms, and there's, there's always more space outside of that entailment cone, which cannot be reached from those axioms. Yeah, that's sort of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Yeah, um, right. Well, uh, uh, but the the statement is that there are. I believe that the computational irreducibility and the in the incompleteness theorem is a consequence of the fact that there can always there can always be infinite paths of entailment. If the if all paths of entailment had to be finite, you wouldn't be able to make that conclusion. I think that's I think that's how that works out. But but the point is. Okay, so this is the thing I... In the finite realized. universe, there is no incompleteness. In principle, you can enumerate all possible cases, right? So it's right. only when you have infinite... Uh, infinity. Right. And I think, by the way, the thing about decidability, so in physics, time is usually infinite in a first, you know, but at a black hole, in a, in a at least a Schwarzschild black hole, time is not infinite. Time ends. In other words, there's a, there's a space-like singularity where all geodesic paths wind up on that, you know, in other words, all spacecraft crash in the same place, so to speak, and time stops for those spacecraft. And I believe in our models, the way that is manifest is the rewrite rules just stop working. So you end up with a, with a essentially you end up with a normal form. You end up in term rewriting, you'd end up with a normal form. You end up with something where you got to a fixed point and that fixed point is, the singularity at the center of a black hole. And so the idea is decidable theories in mathematics are like black holes in that sense, in the sense that they are places where sort of all paths, lead, you know, that every path is finite, so to speak. So my, my view of the future of mathematics is actually similar to my view of the future of, of the universe, which is, you know, the future of the universe is probably, there's a bunch of black holes and then the, the rest of the universe might still be expanding, but there's a bunch of black holes sitting there. And in mathematics, those will be the burnt out theories that became decidable, so to speak. There's still more mathematics to discover, but some theories became decidable and essentially burnt out as black hole-like structures. That's my somewhat bizarre view of, um, I mean, but, but let, let's take your point about time because I think it's very interesting. In, you know, proof, I think is like time in mathematics. But I think much of mathematics as it is practiced is not about starting from the axioms and using an automated theorem proving system to grind forward from those axioms. I, I think a better view is um, it's about, well, okay, so in my Rouliad picture with you know, our collection of Turing machines, there are three ways in which the Rouliad is infinite. Way number one, all possible Turing machine rules. Way number two, all possible initial conditions. Way number three, infinite time. So the, the full Rouliad is the result of all those limits. I think in physics, what we are seeing is we are, we are localized to a certain region with respect to, you know, we're mostly probing the the uh, you know, localized region of rules, localized region of initial states going through time. Whereas in mathematics, maybe what's happening is that time, we don't have very much time. We're not, we're not seeing much depth in time. What we're seeing then is a small amount of proving, which is making a bunch of puzzle pieces, which basically only fit, which, you know, which fit together 
by virtue of different initial conditions. So what I'm saying is, is in this thing, we're asking, instead of saying we just derive everything forever, we're saying we don't do very long derivations, but now we have to fit together all these different pieces that will, will only fit, let's see, I'm, I'm, this is hard to explain. I, I, this is something I've been thinking about in the last week or so, so it's, not, um, it's still rather fresh. Mm -hmm. um, but, but no, I think it's a very interesting question. What, what, you know, is there a role for time in mathematics? And you know, I think I have a view that, that mathematics might be a slice of the Rouliad where we are not doing what we do in physics, where we're seeing the progression of time, but instead we're seeing uh, this thing of sort of fitting together of different initial conditions, um, which is uh, the, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, but I mean, it isn't, you know, one question about mathematics is what is the infinite time limit of mathematics? And your claim is, and my claim too, that mathematics is unbounded. Um, but the question is, what is the texture of that? Like in physics, we have the notion of space and space has a certain uniformity to it. What's the analog of space in mathematics? You know, what's the analog of space in metamathematics, for example? Is there a, a sense in which all those statements of mathematics live in some sort of uniform space about which we can make general statements like general relativity? So this is my contention, okay? This is what I've been thinking about. So I'm, I'm, um, uh, well, my contention is mm -hmm. that uh, the, it could be the case. I'm curious what you think of this. Okay, so, so imagine the Pythagorean theorem, okay? Mm -hmm. And ask, how do you make that axiomatically? And the answer is, if you look at actual formalized mathematics systems, people don't necessarily agree about that. There are multiple different foundations that people all call the Pythagorean theorem independent of, of, of how you precisely define the real numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one possibility, so we've got this cloud of different sort of axiomatic formulations that we all call the Pythagorean theorem. So then the question is, as you build on the Pythagorean theorem, does that cloud of different foundations stay together or does it get shredded to pieces? That is, as you build on the Pythagorean theorem and you prove the next theorem, does it matter what your assumption about real numbers is or not? If it doesn't, then that's like motion in physical space. It's like you have this object that is the Pythagorean theorem and you're able to sort of move it around and, uh, and it stays together, as opposed to if it matters which of the foundations you used, it's kind of shredding that object. Well, fantastic. Fantastic stuff, Stephen. I, I understood best this new stuff you were doing at the beginning. And now that it's advancing by leaps and bounds and becoming more comprehensive and spreading outside of physics into different areas, I have to confess that uh, much of the time I see through a glass darkly. But, um, but I think it, it's wonderful that you're, that you're doing all of this. And um, I want to come back to Platonism because I'm really interested in your Platonism. views about Platonism. Because because the, the, all the stuff that I'm saying is my basic. I believe in intuition. You know, in practice, formal systems don't interest me. They, I think they're only of interest to shoot them down. You know, I think that Gödel, in a sense, is a refutation of formal systems. You know, I I don't like formal systems. I like intuitive mathematics and. I, I agree that some mathematical results need long proofs, complicated proofs, but I like mathematical results that once you, you see why it's true, it's very short and very understandable and doesn't involve much calculation, you know, that it's just, right. so, so that's intuition and um, uh, a new viewpoint that makes something obvious. That it, it, you see, okay, so the, the point of this Rouliad well, goes This is how I like to do mathematics, right? So, right. so but, but we're talking about uh, formal systems because that's what fits into the Rouliad, right? No, it, it's the Rouliad. The coordinatization of the Rouliad is formal systems. If you want to coordinateize it and actually explicitly uh -huh. do things with it, uh -huh. you need formal systems. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. But so, so the claim is going to be that uh, mathematics exists in the same sense that physics exists. Okay. So in other words, <laughs> if you believe that the, you know, you've got this formal Rouliad thing and we're sampling it and that is giving us physics, 
The claim is that mathematics is a different sampling of the Rouliad. And if we claim, you know, in physics, we have intuitive beliefs because we live in the physical, we, you know, we, we're used to things happening in the physical world. In mathematics, we say we don't have, you know, we might have said we don't have intuitive beliefs because it always has to be formal systems. But what this is saying is actually it's, you know, it's based in the exact same thing that physics is based in. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand completely what you're saying, but it, it seems like a pretty natural assertion to me. You're working it out in detail in a certain framework of ideas, your new right. approach. But, um, you know, I never saw a very big difference between physics and pure mathematics, frankly, especially when I advocate um, uh, using experimental methods in um, in pure mathematics to sometimes come up with new principles because they're pragmatically helpful, um, you know, even though you can't prove them. So uh, in other words, I, you know, as uh, what did Arnold, did he say, uh, pure mathematics is like physics expect, except the experiments are cheaper because you do them on a computer. So, so I think there's, there's a point in, in, in all of that, right? So let me ask a question about, about platonic mathematics and so on. Okay, let's imagine we run into the aliens and the aliens have invented, you know, something they call mathematics. Right, octopus mathematics. For yeah, right. So what would you expect? In other words, is there, in my view, there are different possible observers of the Rouliad who can be utterly incoherent in their views of what's going on. So for example, my basic claim is the reason we haven't run into a bunch of extraterrestrial aliens, so to speak, is because there's both a position in physical space that we have to sort of match up, and there's a position in this Rulial space, which is essentially our description language for talking about the universe, which has to match up. If those description languages don't match, we just have an utterly incoherent view of what's happening in the universe. And so my question is for mathematics, can you imagine, you know, in other words, what is that? Is there, given the same underlying structure, the same set of all possible formal systems and so on, what, you know, could you imagine utterly different mathematics that lives on top of that same infrastructure? Yeah, there's a criterion of naturalness, you know, in mathematics. If you if you create very artificial structures, you can publish papers about it, but it, nobody will think it's significant. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of human mathematics on this planet um, in different periods, it really looks totally different. The, it, the spirit looks different. The kinds of questions that are of interest look different. The way the way you publish papers and what you say in the papers looks different. You know, it, as a function of time. Um, what is considered to be good mathematics really changes. And so in a way, you know, these are the alien creatures are ourselves 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The style of doing mathematics uh, is, is totally different. If you look at Euler, Euler's intuition is wonderful, but, um, you know, he, um, he, he uses arguments that are that are quasi empirical. And sometimes he does experiments, comes up with stuff. Um, he, he does a calculation one way and another way and the first 20 digits look the same. So he says this infinite series must sum to that, you know, there is. A, so, so it's a different style of doing mathematics. Um, um, That's and, an interesting point of view. I mean, I think, you know, if we go back to Euclid, for example, mm -hmm. there's, there's a question of what I mean, okay, I, I find an interesting progression. Euclid was trying to write down sort of a logical structure for geometry. Newton, for example, in his original Principia Mathematica, he presents it like, like Euclid. I mean, he states his laws of motion as axioms. And so I'm curious what the, I mean, you know, what, what is your, from a sort of platonic point of view, what was Euclid trying to do? Um, well, it's theoretical physics, right? Geometry is a little like theoretical physics. Because your people, you know, uh, my friend Benoit Mandelbrot, he wanted his book to be called "The Memoirs of a Geometer," because in in France, a mathematician used to be called a geometer. You know, in glorious periods of French history. So, um, so to the Greeks, uh, geometry had very clear, intuitive meaning, physical meaning, right? They, 
so that's a different that's a different conception of uh, that's a different conception of of the we tend to take one two three four five and uh, piano arithmetic sort of as the most basic structure in math but I think uh, in ancient Greek uh, I think geometry was regarded as uh, as well it might because there's a lot more intuition involved with geometry. Um, I don't well, but, know. and in that, fact, that, that intuition is actually very yeah. physical intuition. I mean, in other words, visual that, has to do with our visual system and yeah, right. physical intuition. Right. Right. It's but but so, I mean, ability. then, so I'm curious what, when you, uh, let's come back to this question about beauty in mathematics versus Platonism versus whatever. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to get my, my arms around this question of, of what, um, uh, you know, what is the relationship between sort of the concept of, of, you know, things that might be true in mathematics, things that might be beautiful in mathematics? What is the relationship as you see it between those? Well, I don't know. Um, what is this joke? A uh, mathematician is known by the number of uh, ugly proofs he's published because pioneering work is ugly. Um, um, I, I think there's no permanent place in mathematics for ugly mathematics because uh, I think the aesthetic, well, maybe there is if you're doing very complicated, looking at very complicated applied questions, but fundamental mathematical ideas, it seems to me they get more and more basic. They're not getting more and more complicated. Um, well, but by basic, I mean, th this question about the, the notion of beauty, which I think, I mean, would you agree that that is a fundamentally human notion, that there's no beyond the human notion of that? Not, or, or would not, you not completely. I, I think that's certainly one aspect of the notion of beauty, but there might be intrinsic aspects having to do with simplicity and symmetry. Look, uh, ancient Greek math is based on f physical intuition, geometry, right? Visual, the visual mm -hmm. system, right? You and I are inspired by computation, algorithm, right. on discrete symbolic systems as our fundamental ontology, you know, from which we build everything. To the ancient Greeks, it was visual and spatial intuition, Euclidean geometry. And there might be other bases for, um, you know, I think you have to, to do good mathematics, you have to believe in the system that you're exploring. You, you have to think it's fundamental, you have to have an intuition for it, you have to feel comfortable living in this world of ideas that in the case of Archim Archimedes and um, Euclid was, Euclid. was yeah. And in our case has more to do with computation and algorithms um, that thanks to the fact that you and I have both programmed an immense amount and everybody does nowadays, there's a tremendous amount of intuition for programming and software as, you know, they're, they're, they're platonic ideas really the notion of not as much there. intuition as well. I mean, like, for example, yeah. this fact that you can write a simple program and have it do complicated things, that is, that still surprises people. I mean, that's a, and in a sense, the, um, uh, I mean, that isn't, you know, that's your busy beavers, that's, you know, all these things, that, uh, that, that fact is, is um, but I mean, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, so, I've been exploring this question of, of um, you know, we um, create we create these artificial worlds of beautiful ideas that we use to try to understand things, and um, so it was geometrical intuition at one point. For you and me, it's uh, software and algorithms, and there may be others. There may be other the the physic the physical world that we see is a complicated mess and. And you have to invent a system of ideas that, that fit together beautifully. And right. stuff in the real world doesn't fit together beautifully. It's all messy. It's complicated. It's hard to do an experiment that gives you a clear answer. So to build a fundamental ontology, we can't, create, we can't build a model of the world out of, out of marshmallows, for example. We need some structure that is very clear and that, to hold in our minds. So at one point it was geometry, uh, now it's software, computation, algorithm. But but the human being is constantly inventing this, right? At one well, point, so somewhere in the middle of that history was theology. And we talked a little bit about that sure, before. Sure. And I'm curious what you see as being, I mean, you, you mentioned that Gödel, for example, 
was the theist. this conception. So what was Gödel's view of the relationship between God and Platonic mathematics? Well, one could also answer Cantor's, uh, Cantor's view. Cantor, was, I think, was, was definitely inspired by theological ideas, right? These infinities are a way of approaching God in the limit, in an infinite limit. And the, 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 the chain of all, the series of all cardinalities, infinite cardinalities are all infinite ordinals, um, you know, is sort of a transcendent object. So um, that but cannot so be grasped as a whole, right? So it shows human limitations and you can take it as a metaphor for God, something that you cannot be fully comprehended only in sort of the limit from below, right? So these are all acts of imagination and intuition. It's a beautiful structure that Cantor comes up with. Now, it's not completely determined, for example, because we don't know the answer to the continuum, uh, the question. So uh, right. where Euclidean geometry is uh, more down to earth, but not as inspiring, not as theolo the theological uh, a structure. Cantor's stuff may be crazy, but it inspired a lot of abstract mathematics. Uh, the whole approach of the 20th century, in a way, was inspired by the level of abstraction that Cantor reached with these right. infinities, right? Even though it's crazy. But, uh, but, yeah. But I mean, the notion that you just go bigger, bigger, bigger until you eventually have the everything thing. Yeah, but there is yeah. no everything thing. It's an open system. I, I understand. But, but already, but, that's a Gödel's incompleteness theorem in the Can Cantor's formulation. Okay, but so what the did Cantor think about? be thought of as closed. There is no set of all possible cardinalities because that would give you a cardinality that is bigger than all possible cardinalities. Okay, so, so this is a paradoxical asking, notion. If you if you know, did Gödel and Cantor, if they were kind of monotheists who believe there is a God, one, who is sort of the everything, everything. Yeah, Cantor how did they, and Gödel seem to have been monotheists, right? That's very bizarre that they didn't believe in a transfinite God, so to speak. Yeah, it, when I see Cantor's infinite sequence, it, it, it reminds me of uh, the Mahabharata and the Hindu conception, uh, where, but anyway, but th that wasn't too well known in Europe, maybe not by everybody. But, but why yeah. didn't they find that a contradiction? I mean, that is the, the, the concept that there is no largest why was that not contradictory with the kind of... It is contradictory, but you see, the notion of an infinite God is already ungraspable by finite beings, right? So, so it, the, the fact that it's contradictory makes it good, actually makes it more like theology, you know, that this is this ungraspable notion. So that's for th theology or philosophy, but for doing mathematics, it's scary that you get contradictions. But look, we've talked about three different basic kinds of intuitions out of which to build mathematics. The first was that mathematics is geometry, basically. That's the fundamental issue, which comes from the visual system. And, and then the next, there's another one, we're probably skipping stuff in the middle, or well, you know, theology somehow in the Middle Ages. Then comes Cantor, who builds the universe out of set theory, this notion of, of set, which inspires an awful lot of abstract mathematics for the hundred years after Cantor. And now you and I are being inspired by a completely different ontology, a completely different software and algorithm, which is also a fantasy because they're, you know, the a general purpose Turing machine is not in the physical world that, that we can see at any rate, because the computation can go on forever. It never makes mistakes. It has unlimited, always finite, but unlimited storage capacity. This is already an abstraction. This is a beautiful idea that is simpler than the mess of real computers, which run out of electricity, which break down, you know, you can't afford to pay for it anymore, or you can't have enough air conditioning to cool it. So, so you see these beautiful ideas that, that people use in different times to think about the world and about their lives uh, change. And that's an example of human imagination at work. And the fact that none of us want to just stay doing exactly what was being done before. You don't want to, I don't want to, Cantor didn't want to, Turing didn't want to, you know. So, so that, that's an example of human creativity and imagination in action. I right. think it's a very beautiful example. These are great artistic intellectual creations, it seems to me, these ideas. So, so the thing that, you know, but you the invent is them. There is no such thing as a Turing machine. Right. Turing, in created the Turing machine by 
by imagining it. And Cantor created this open-ended uh, system of infinite numbers. He created it. I don't think it actually existed. So this is a, a, a different view of Platonicism, if you like, a slightly different view. Right. I think, I think my point of view now is this Rouliad object yes. is, you know, there is the Rouliad, which is this entangled limit of Turing machines or any other kind of computational system. Hypergraph rewriting doesn't really matter. You know, they're all equivalent. Um, that's that. There is also a hyper Rouliad. In fact, there's a whole transfinite, you know, zoo of hyper Rouliads, which are the things that have the Oracle Turing machines and so on in them. Right. So the big statement then, in the end, my only claim about everything we know is there's one statement. We live in the Rouliad and not the hyper Rouliad. Okay, well, that's saying, yeah. The, so in other words, that is the only, my claim is that is the only contingent fact about the world. That is all other, the structure of the Rouliad, the structure of the hyper Rouliad, these are all necessary. The contingent fact, just like the contingent fact that we live on planet Earth in this random corner of the universe, so to speak, that's a contingent fact. I also claim it's a contingent fact that we live in the Rouliad, not in the hyper Rouliad. Okay, so you're saying we can imagine a world where there are oracles for the halting problem, but we're not in that world. That's correct. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And just like we don't happen to be, you know, we're living 14.6 billion years after the beginning of the universe, we're living, you know, there's a certain contingency to where we happen to be. And that, the, and the claim would be that the, the, that, you know, that that's the only ultimate contingent fact about the world. The other sort of footnote to that is, and we have certain beliefs about how things work, like that we believe that, that, that we are persistent through time. And I don't know what the analog until, is. Until a member of the family dies, then you realize that we're not that persistent through time. Right. And well, there's a... There's a changes in science and you realize that... Well, yes, but, but I mean, this, this question about the, the, you know, we believe in a thread of experience that is, you know, we have a consistent thread of experience, but yes, it, it halts, you know, we die, it, the, the, the thread halts. Yeah, also, as I get older, I'm not the person I was when I was in my 20s or my 30s, and I find it more and more difficult to remember why I was so enthusiastic about mathematics, for example, at that age. Or get a right. second theorem. I remember I was, and now it, it seems a little strange to me. Now I might be more enthusiastic about, say, uh, colonizing Mars might be uh, a fun project to do, for example. I, I have, having, having no, only known you for what, 40 years or something, I, I can say that I think you've always had some enthusiasm for, the, um, uh, for these, you know, practical uh, kind of um, yes. uh, what's possible things. Uh, even if even if the even if the um the kind of quotes well not even day job has been these uh, these very theoretical kinds of ideas yeah but, well both of us uh, enjoy greatly doing engineering projects right yes yes but but just engineering it's nice to complement that with some theoretical work but i think the engineering keeps us grounded for example a lot of my intuition in the for um, the theoretical work I do has has to do with the fact that I learned to program at a very early age when this was unusual. So for me, an algorithm was always a very concrete object. I'd written lots of them and seen them running. So I felt very comfortable in that platonic world of ideas and and studied proving theorems about that. You know, so I I, th I think that our two activities really uh, complement each other, and it, it's good to do both. It seems to right. Be. So I, I'm curious in, in um, uh, you know, I, I've recently been, so my, my current project actually has to do with this, what I'm calling the physicalization of metamathematics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, what is bulk metamathematics? You look at, you know, we, we have 3 million theorems that have been written down in the literature of mathematics, but there's an infinite number of possible such, such you know, theorems, statements, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. what is the full structure of that space? What is the kind of, what's yeah. the... Well, I, one thing that bothers me a lot is the space of all possible ideas, all possible conceivable conceptual schemes for basing philosophy. You know, we've talked about geometry, theology, Cantorian set theory, and the notion of computation. But what is going to stop 
the next generation from coming up with another paradigm, another set, another to intellectual toolkit for trying to understand the world. And that space is tremendously undefined, the space of all possible conceptual schemes that one might come up with, you know. <laughs> I, well, I, I smile slightly because I'm trying to invent this thing that I'm calling observer theory, which is an attempt to actually make that not as, in other words, the statement that from this Ruliad, certain slices, are, you know, the slices that we are taking because of who we are, because we are observers who assume that we are persistent in time, are computationally bounded, etc. Mm -hmm. Those facts about us as observers force us, okay, there may be many detailed slices of this Ruliad that we can take, but right. given those attributes alone, we are forced into general relativity, for example. That is a generic fact, just as the second law of thermodynamics is a generic fact about gas molecules, independent of whether it's hydrogen or oxygen or whatever else. Well, that's terrific. That shows the richness and the power of the set of ideas you're working with now. And by all means, you know, you should continue, it seems to me. I'm right. I'm not to tell you what to do. But, right. But, 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 it, no, but the, the fact the, the, that you're having so much fun and coming up with applications in so many different areas suggests that these ideas are, are very important. I, 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 I'm I not able to follow what you're doing as well as I could at the beginning because it's getting very sophisticated, your system. Yeah, yeah, right. No, this is the problem. The, the tower is, you know, at the, the beginning. Is, it's the, getting the higher, higher gets... and I'm getting older, you know, and I'm also running after two, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, which is a sort of a, wonderful but tiring activity so which uh, makes you younger i suspect i think yes it the, actually does it, 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 certainly, does. it um, certainly does but 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 no i mean the, your your point about you know what is the space of all possible ideas what is the po space of all possible ways of thinking about things yeah i couldn't is, think of how to get a handle on that how to come well so that that's what i think this sort of observer theory idea is about so the claim is it's that, a, certainly a step in that direction yeah right i mean the, the claim is that that if you assume that we have certain attributes, we are computationally bounded, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have persistence, then there are a certain set of kinds of observations that we can do of this underlying ruling out of all possible formal systems. And my claim is physics, as we currently perceive it, is one of those. Mathematics, as we currently do it, is another one of those. And you know, the question is always what kind of, you know, what are the details of the observer? So for example, in mathematics, I believe that the, the theorem, in a sense, that I'd like to be able to show is that, that well, the analog of, of the fact that there can be motion in physical space is the fact that there can be mathematical ideas like the Pythagorean theorem that mm. have persistence and are not shredded as you try and use them, so to speak. That they don't turn into, so in other words, that, they, that there is a, a a set of ideas in mathematics that can be, that it's possible to do higher level mathematics, which it might, I mean, so this is a question. Why is it possible to do higher level mathematics? Why is it possible to have these kind of bigger ideas and not just always to be down at the level of, you know, chasing some particular piano axiom and so on and so on and so on? I mean- Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very deep question. Yeah, that's a very deep question. But I, I mean, I think the answer is, my, my feeling is the answer is, it's the same really reason. I have a, a framework for attacking this, right? For analyzing this. If right. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Right. I mean, but I claim that the, the reason it works is the same reason that we have a notion of space. Mm -hmm. And that it might not be. We, in the notion of space, we might not have. It might be, it's just all down at the level of atoms of space and it's all incredibly complicated and so on. And um, the... Uh, the question of, of what, um, you know, the fact that we have such a notion, I claim, is similar to the fact that it's possible to have a coherent notion of mathematics. And mm -hmm. in fact, the, 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 the claim might be that, I mean, and this, this is something I'm trying to understand. My, my wife keeps on telling me I need to understand this. And she's, she, I think, understands it, but I don't yet. Um, uh, you know, the relationship of kind of Euclid's notion of, okay, Euclid's notion of the existence of points, Euclid's notion that, that 
Actually, okay, let me, let me mention another thing about continuum hypothesis and the continuum, okay? So yes. if you believe that we are persistent through time, that we have a persistence, I think for sort of Zeno-like reasons, that implies that we believe in the continuum. In other words, if we know that we are who we are now, and we know that um, as we progress into the future, we will continue to be who we are now, that means that there can't, there has to be a, 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 a sort of continuous thread from now to the future. We can't be jumping, you know, it's like saying, there's a thing moving around on my screen and it's jumping pixel to pixel, but I have to have the, the conceptual framework that says it's a continuous thing moving around rather than it's jumping pixel to pixel. In other words, as soon as we have this belief that it's the same thing moving forward, I think that sort of implies the continuum. That, that implies that we have a conception of the continuum. It doesn't imply that the continuum is actually implemented. It just means that our conceptual model of the world is the continuum, I, I think. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I've just been figuring this stuff out very recently. Yeah, yeah, well, you're doing, you're doing very fundamental uh, metaphysics, well, ontology even. It, it sounds like the pre-Socratics, you know, uh, take a stick, divide it in half, divide the halves in half, keep going. There are two possibilities. Either you can keep dividing forever or you come to atoms at some point. And these are very basic questions you've enriched it by knowing an awful lot of physics and taking the notion of uh, computation uh, and making it the the fun the basis of your ontology and um, right hey what should we call there are atoms which i like the ruliad by the way the iliad and the ruliad right yeah yeah right no i i like that name it's one of these names where once you think of it it's like that's a name i've got to use absolutely <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They're beautiful ideas. Now, you're doing more than philosophy, though, because the idea is you can, you're going to do computations. You have people who are going to be writing physics papers, working out the right. ideas in more detail. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's really terrific. You're sort of running ahead of the pack, throwing out more and more ideas for more and more people to develop in detail, right? Right. Well, the, the problem, I mean, in... in um, yeah, by the way, so I, I got to ask you, the... the um, so we're trying to name the elementary, the sort of the smallest units of existence. So mm -hmm. atoms are the thing that the Greeks called sort of the smallest units of physical existence. But we've also got the smallest units of mathematical existence, the things that are below variables, the things where a giant cluster of these things represents the number one, let's say. And so the, the, um, you know, what I have been calling these in, you know, in, in physics, atoms of space is a nice name for them for, for thinking about them as elements of space. But mm -hmm. the question is, um, the, and, you know, I, I have been just calling them elements, which is kind of a lame name. Yes, well, just, excuse me, if I'm up, there's someone at the door. Just as things get interesting, hello. Yeah. Okay. You were just about to reveal it. Well, I'm an I'm just important about secret to, and the doorbell rang. Right. I'm just uh, about to pick your brain for, for something from history or, or, or elsewhere. I mean, yes. so we've been thinking about... Um, you want a name for atoms of ideas or... Yes. The, the, the most fundamental element of existence. What should it be called? In what, the, what is the world of mathematics. What's that? Or, or existence in math or physics. Exactly. Or, or it is the it is the thing from which you build. It is it is the the elementary uh, kind of thing with identity. It's only it's only fact about itself is it has identity, and it, it may then have relations to other such things and so on. And um, so the the current leading contenders are the eme e m e or ont o n t, um, neither of which I like. Yeah, uh, what did Leibniz call the monads? Yes, I know, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding those because every single time, every time I ask somebody about those, somebody uh, says monads, right? It's, it's the, getting on. Yeah, I mean, so, but, but also <laughs> the problem with it is I still don't understand what they are. I mean, and every time I talk to some Leibniz scholar, I seem to get a different view of what monads are. How much stuff is there in a monad? Is yeah, it like the whole a, universe packed into one of these things? Yeah, Is and I have a, 
a different view also. I think he was just trying to, I don't take the monodology seriously. I think he was just trying to show that certain ideas are not completely contradictory. The same way he wanted to reconcile Protestantism with Catholicism, the same way he wanted to reconcile uh, scholastic philosophy or ancient Greek philosophy with the, what is it called? Uh, what was science called? Uh, science was originally called the mechanical philosophy or something, right? He wanted to show that it wasn't a contradiction between theology and a notion of God and, and the mechanical philosophy, which was the original name given to the beginnings of theoretical physics, right? I didn't know that so, name. I never heard that name. I, I mean, I heard it called natural philosophy. I never heard it called mechanical philosophy. I think it was called, I'm not sure. What was the term that Leibniz used? Maybe I'm confusing things. But, but so, uh, so tell me so, about that. I, I don't know about this. So I think the monod monodology is, I think a very important point in Leibniz's time was, first of all, he felt that it would be politically dangerous to throw away religion because he felt that it played an important role in human society and people's lives and they could lead to tremendous instability that the french philosophes were leading us into uh, dangerous waters which could lead to political uncertainty unrest social disaster so but he saw the what was it called the skeleton no, the mechanical philosophy or natural philosophy growing and I think he, 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 he wants to reconcile the two so that you won't throw away modern science, which was just beginning, but he could see the, its promise and its potential. Newton had just published the Principia, for example. Um, and, and, and Leibniz did work on theoretical physics, right? Um, the conservation of energy is his idea, for example, I think, or conservation of momentum. In the, I'm not sure about it's called the metaphysique. There, he discusses elastic and inelastic collisions, or at least one of them. Well, anyway, so anyway, so 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 he he would like to keep both systems. Leibniz is always trying to find a way to compatibilize systems that seem, um, on the face of it, to contradict each other. And so I think that explains the the strange nature of the monodology. I don't think he took it seriously, but it it is a proof that there is a model which works for medieval theology and he thinks it also works for science. And, and therefore they're not contradictory and therefore we can have scientific progress while not having all the social unrest that abandoning religion might, might lead to. So I think that was the kind of thing that he was trying to do with the monodology. Um, That's interesting. So I don't, I don't understand that. I mean, you're, so you're saying that that what was his conception of, of, of theology? And then what was his, I mean, he thought that the science was showing that the universe is somehow mechanical and therefore has no need for God. Is that, is that kind of the- Well, some, some philosophers were arguing that, you know, I think Descartes was viewed as uh, dangerous. He, Descartes had to flee, for example. Yeah, the, if, if you- have a mechanical universe governed by the laws of mechanics or the laws of physics in a way that doesn't leave much room for God anymore, except to choose the laws, maybe start the thing going. Well, except and then in our model of the Rouliad, there is no choice. Well, because you have all possible laws uh, superimposed on each other and, and entangling. That's a beautiful idea. If you can work it all out, you probably have. I don't, don't understand it all, but that's really fantastic. Yeah, I thought that was great. Like all possible programs going into the halting probability, you have all possible rules of time evolution sort of working simultaneously. That's right. a fantastic idea. So, so I think so. So I think that Leibniz has discussions of uh, politics, and 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 I think he's worried about the impact of the French philosophes who were basically interpreted as atheists, right? Uh, in the case of Voltaire, it's sort of obvious, but in other cases, it was more subtle because like Descartes, but it's still there. So, um, so, and that, that, that- but Why did Voltaire hate Leibniz so much? I mean, why did Voltaire mock Leibniz to the extent he did? Well, he didn't understand Leibniz. You know, his mistress, the Marquise of, I don't know, uh, what was her name? The Marquise of something. Uh, she translated Newton into French, for example. So she she understood uh, science much better than 
Voltaire, but Voltaire was very good at writing uh, polemical uh, tracts, right? Um, it was a very good PR person. Right. But so he, you think he, do you think that he, he was after Leibniz just because he didn't understand what Leibniz was about? Or, or you think he Well, he, a... he was in favor of Newton because Newton, although Newton claimed he wasn't, but he saw Newton as a good argument for atheism. And um, so, and whereas Leibniz is trying to keep theology with, and also do modern science, develop modern science. So, so, so. But so how do monads help? So monads are something which are sort of not quite clockwork. Is that kind of the, because they somehow have something inside them that isn't, that isn't as clockworky as, as. Yeah, I'm, I'm not prepared to defend this the the intuition I just stated about monads in in detail, uh, because in fact I have not I have not tried to understand the the, the, the you know uh, the monads intimately, uh, the monadology, um, because the whole thing to me looks looks very unnatural. I just have a, a hunch as to why Leibniz came up with that system based on my. Uh, understanding of his sort of psychology and the kind of projects he worked in during his whole life. Uh, that's, that's just a guess. That's just a guess, I, uh, an intuition I came up with. Oh, that's, uh, I think it's a good intuition, because I mean, from what I know of Leibniz, it's more on the logic side and more on the, you know, I want to, you know, Leibniz was a systematizer trying to kind of organize everything and make everything. Um, right, but he was at some level uh, a theist, I think, um, and um, he didn't see an incompatible. He believed that God could be understood through reason. He didn't believe those who say that God can only be understood through faith, which was a philosophical current in the Middle Ages. Right. So, so, so for him, God and reason are not incompatible, and I think for Gödel that would also be the case. And, is... and what was, what, what do you know about Gödel? I mean, I talked about both Gödel and Cantor and their views of theology. And your, I mean, your, your basic point there is that they saw part of what they were doing as the, as the sort of pushing the humility of humans, so to speak, on the grounds that the, you know, there are things out there like transfinite numbers that humans will somehow never be able to fully wrap their arms around. No, but on the other hand, Cantor is giving us a path to God. If you contemplate his open-ended series of bigger and bigger infinities, this is much more concrete than medieval theology. You know, this is a mathematical structure, the lower levels of which we do mathematics in, the lower levels are whole numbers, the real numbers, then you jump to the set of all subsets of the reals, the set of all subsets of that. And, you know, at, at every level, the, tra the transition makes sense and is really very sharp intellectually, right? It's just when you make the whole thing completely open-ended that it just goes on and on and on. And at some point it goes way beyond anything we have names for, right? Uh, it's even with constructive ordinals, right? So th there is a mystical element in a way uh, Cantor is doing math, beautiful deep mathematics, which inspired uh, the whole approach to mathematics is set theoretical coming after him, right? Um, but on the other hand, it seems to me that he was inspired. Uh, there are theological elements to what he's doing, it seems to me. But that, that's basically the, the remark I wanted to make. Uh, right. We, sh we should probably wrap up soon because we've been going a long time, but I noticed... Yeah, Gettle Incompleteness is a more... The, the Turing hierarchy of Oracle for the halting problem, Oracle for the... Or, for the machines that have oracles for the halting problem. That's another beautiful hierarchy, but it's a much more down to earth hierarchy, right? It doesn't have it, the paradoxical elements of Cantor's hierarchy of, in, of infinities. What is uh, the relationship between those two hierarchies? I mean, one of them is kind of this arithmetic hierarchy of, um, uh, of, you know, I don't know what they are, you know, 
all these pi one sigma, you know, pi n sigma n yeah. sentences. Well, so I think the relationship is that the 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 Turing hierarchy corresponds to the um, constructive ordinals. Really, it's that part, that initial segment of the hierarchy of all ordinals that Cantor imagined. And that's a part that is not contradictory and that you can sort of wrap your mind around mathematically uh, fairly so, well. So you're saying that if, if I go to the, the, you know, the, I mean, there's a transfinite collection of, uh, you know, this hierarchy of, um, uh, of, of Turing machine oracles that forms, mm -hmm. you can label those by transfinite ordinals, can you not? Right, I think so, yeah. Uh, and so, so then what you're saying is- As constructive, constructive transfinite ordinals, right. Right, but then you're saying there is a, there is a, a beyond those, there are the non-constructive transfinite ordinals. You know, I have to ask you about a comment. I remember a footnote in Gödel's paper where he says that, um, you know, while, while Gödel's theorem basically shows that we can't, you know, get to all truths axiomatically, the human mind might be able to do it by some kind of, you know, ramified sequence of types ramified into the transfinite. He says that I something I, like that. Yeah, I don't think I saw that for now. What the, what I've seen is a paper that maybe he never released for publication, or, and well, or, or there are versions that he did, where he says that mathematical intuition can sometimes enable a mathematician to have direct contact with the Platonic world of ideas. And he doesn't see his own incompleteness theorem as a limit to what human mathematicians can accomplish. He, he, he gave his formula for getting to the platonic world of ideas. You have to be in a place where it has no noise. Maybe you close your eyes. Um, okay, so this is going very you know, much along the religious lines, so to speak, of, of a, a, you know, kind of it, it relates right down to the practice of... It's... It's where do, I see it as being, where does the creative imagination come up with fundamental new concepts? Cantor did, Gödel did, Turing did. These are all acts of imagination. And one view is that the things that they imagined actually existed and they just formalized them or gave names to them. Another view is that these things never existed. There's just the chaos of everyday life. And, and each one of these mathematicians created the world that they, lived in after that Cantor's world of the world of set theory right. um see, the world see, of computer right. structures yeah my, my point of view is a, a little bit of a bizarre tweak on all of that because it's saying at the bottom of everything is this Rouliad that's mm -hmm. at the bottom of physics too so physics. insofar as we talk about things being real if we believe physics is real we're saying we also believe mathematics is real Mathematics is as real or as unreal as physics is. I'll buy that because I never saw such a big difference between the two anyway, but that's for a different reason. But, um, you know, when you get to this level of philosophy, um, sort of all viewpoints contribute something, right? It's not uh -huh. a black or white situation. They're complementary aspects of a, of a situation. And I think what you're doing is terrific. I I think it's also interesting to know previous viewpoints about all these things. Yeah. Uh, Leibniz was very generous. You know, he studied everything. He studied astrology. He studied scholastic philosophy. He studied ancient Greek philosophy. Um, and he saw some good in all of them, right? Because um, they're all no, attempts of human beings to create conceptual systems to understand their existence. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, so one of the things that has been a big surprise to me in our project is that you're absolutely right, that it, it plays into all these different sets of ideas, whether they're in technical mathematical physics or in philosophy and so on. And one of the things that's really nice about it is it keeps on making something in the middle between two dichotomous kinds of ideas. It's in the middle, but more bizarre than either of them. And, you know, it is in a sense a bit disappointing at some level that, that some of what we're doing is going back to the pre-Socratics. I mean, that is that the questions we're asking are, you know, are similar to the questions that were asked then. Yeah, but the answers you're giving are different. You're enriching it with, with sure. new ideas that they could never have imagined. Right, right. No, it, it's true. I mean, I think that, I mean, I don't know, what, what is your theory for why Leibniz didn't get universal computation? Ah, uh, 
Well, I think he did pretty well. I'm. Oh, I agree. I, he did pretty well. But but I, he was. So I don't know close. what your impression is. I. He may be the most intelligent person that ever existed, as far as I know. You know, I'm I'm very impressed. I, when I when I heard that Gödel at the end of his life didn't do any more research and spent all his time studying Leibniz, I thought Gödel went mad. Well, I don't think Gödel went mad. Now I think that Gödel was right that Leibniz is is an amazing mind, and um, and also a bit disorganized. I mean, what he left oh, was, was totally. Kind of, what's that? Totally disorganized. Flies like right. a butterfly from field to field. A letter on this subject, the next day a letter on another subject but a tremendous imagination and very deep, throwing out very deep ideas all the time, like the idea of using human languages to study uh, migrations, the, the names of places or similarities between languages. And now it's applied to DNA, right? To see the, um, right. It's, 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 it's really amazing. Of course, there is this, when one has a hero that one admires, one wants to, Say they anticipated everything. Well, they didn't see. He didn't seem to anticipate the notion of a universal machine, but he did anticipate digital philosophy. I think pretty clearly. I hope I'm not fooling myself. You know that that medallion that he drew in was it in, yeah, yeah. Right. in Latin and in German? You saw the drawings in in German. I think you photographed, right? And no, then, no, I, it's in Latin. It's That's Latin. The one. Yeah, it seems to me that that is is definitely the idea that that zero and one suffice to create the entire universe. I think that was more just. Uh, you think that's really to create the universe? I think that's. I think that's projecting. I think it was merely. You know, for him, it was already surprising that zero and one could create the integers. I mean, because that wasn't obvious in his time. I mean, it, it's some. Um, but but uh, you know, I, I notice on our on our live stream, we have a question here about uh, about super omegas and super recursive functions, which are things I don't know about. But but. Um, do you have any comments on those? Super omegas. Um, yeah, I did some work on that uh, with Veronica Becker in Buenos Aires. Um, what is well, yeah, you get a hierarchy of omegas too, like the same way you get a hierarchy of oracles for the halting problem. Uh, you get a hierarchy of, um, of, of omegas, omegas for, for presumably for, for oracle Turing machines. Right. Right. So you have a halting probability for Turing machines that have an oracle for the halting problem. So that's a, a, a jump of the omega number. Then if you actually what you can do is one way to have an oracle for the halting problem is just to have an oracle for the numerical for the bits of omega that gives you that's a halting problem. So you have omega, you have a Turing machine that comes with an oracle for omega, that has a halting problem, that's the jump of the, uh, of the halting problem. You get a, a hierarchy that's denumerable, and then you can imagine a machine that has oracles for all of those omegas. So that is, um, the subscript would be um, the first infinite uh, ordinal number, right? So that's the lowercase the, omega. So it's big right. omega, low, right. little omega. Right. right, and you can keep going. You can keep going like this. So it's um, so it's it's just a reformulation of um, in terms of halting probabilities instead of oracles for the halting problem. It's it's very much analogous. I don't know if this is answering the question, but I, just just to to come back once more to the continuum hypothesis because I I've been trying to wondering. Is there a way, you know, again, this question in those kinds of terms, is there, you know, if I wanted to make the continuum hypothesis a statement of physics, just like I can make the statement, the only things that we can do in our universe are Turing type computations becomes a statement of physics. Mm -hmm. Is there an analogous statement of physics that is the continuum hypothesis? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, what I have thought about is the question of whether real numbers are real. And you can discuss, do real numbers exist in some sense? And what sense, yes, and in what sense, no. So if we like discrete structures and if we like mm -hmm. what can be computed, the real numbers would not exist, right? But, but the real numbers, 
mathematical analysis is a very beautiful subject, right? That use the real numbers. The mathematics of the real numbers is very beautiful, right? I remember Hardy's book, A Course of Pure Mathematics, right? Uh, published at Cambridge that I studied as a student. It's, it's very beautiful stuff. And it's not surprising that the mathematics, when you assume the continuum in real numbers is simpler and more beautiful than mathematics. Uh, when you smash everything into, into discrete things. Right, right, right. So, so in that sense, aesthetically, the real numbers exist. They may also exist because they help us to understand uh, theoretical physics. The notion of field, for example, is a very beautiful idea. You know, it's the big step after um, action at a distance, uh, forces that depend, that right. particles that depend on them. So the notion of a field is a very important idea in physics. So the notion of the continuum is justified by its usefulness in physics, it's justified aesthetically, but maybe if you take computation as the, your basic philosophical idea, then it doesn't... You know, so, so I, you know, so as of a, a few weeks ago, I realized that I should take the continuum more seriously. As a result okay. of this argument about our perception of persistence, that is, if we believe that we are persistent, we have to believe in the continuum, I claim. That is, because if we have a thread of existence, that is, from every moment, we are the same as we are at the next moment, we can always, you know, give, given two, you know, moments some distance apart, you can always say, well, what's the path between those moments? And that gives you, you know, that implies kind of a, a, you know, a continuous path, so to speak. You can be halfway there, you can be half of halfway there, half of half of halfway there, something like that, right? Right. You were there in some intermediate point and some intermediate point of that and et cetera. Right. I think and, it's a more fundamental idea than the idea of con continuity of motion. That is the continuity that your existence progressing over time is you are the same is sort of more fundamental than the idea that as you move to a different place, you are the same, which is the more traditional view of continuity in geometry. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I mean, I think um, uh, anyway, so, um, well, we should probably, I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting more and more messages saying it's time to wrap up. So. Yeah, Stephen, as always, it's a privilege chatting with you. Uh, I don't know how much I can contribute in the future because you've gone far beyond me and I don't understand Oh, you kind of understand this too. Greg, you, you're going what to you're doing, but whatever you're doing, I think it's wonderful and you should you should keep it up. I, I'm gonna tell you it's something. I, I, I am convinced that that it is the job, it's it's like when you do software design. You know, people say, uh, you know, say that, you know, one point of view is the users aren't going, you know, the users are just too dumb to understand what's going on. Another point of view is, if you're a good software designer, you should be able to get it to the point where the users can understand what's going on. I, you know, my challenge is to get this metamathematics stuff to the point where, where, you know, where you understand what's going on. You can, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's interesting, you know, to me, it is, I mean, you know, there are a bunch of new ideas, which I just don't think have been seen before, but I think they're going to, you know, as, you know, I think they're going to merge. For, for example, I'm pretty sure your omega number, I think I mentioned this, is, is giving one, as it, it's kind of obviously, it's sort of giving one the density of, well, it, it's the density of decidability in metamathematical space, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's also the density of, uh, the density of, of essentially black holes in ruleal space. So I, th I think these things are, which, uh, you know, we don't, you don't know if something is a black hole until mm -hmm. you've waited for an infinite time. That's the, that's the, un, you know, that's the uncomputability of Omega is the statement that I can in principle say the density of black holes in real space is Omega, but I can't know that in any finite time. And that, that's the sort of physical analog, I think. Okay. Well, but, I, I think in a way what you're doing now is at the philosophical level or theoretical, theoretical physics or theoretical metaphysics, what you're doing now is, is closely related to the software work you've done because you're looking for fundamental ideas out of which to build the computational universe. That's the Wolfram language, right? 
Yeah, and right. now you're looking for the fundamental ideas, not for the, well, the fundamental ideas for understanding the computational universe, shall we say, which is different from implementing the calculations. Exactly. But you see, the way I view our computational language is that, that it is a bridge between what we humans can understand and what is computationally possible. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, within it is essentially a coordinization of this Rouliad suitable for us humans in the 21st century, so to speak. That is, and it's, you know, and it has concepts which are, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I don't know, in some discussion we were having about software design recently, I was, people were just insisting it's got to be more and more and more precise. And it's, it's like, you know, look, we're just, you know, the goal of our language is to provide a, a thing that humans in the 21st century can think in terms of. It's not for the dolphins. It's not for, you know, it's not for the atoms of space, so to speak. It's just for humans. You, you know, I was just because I've been working a bit on consciousness and so on and, and uh, how mm -hmm. that relates to all our theories. I, I have something that um, another thing we found to discuss at some point, I, I, I was starting to write a little thing, a semi-fictionalized account about what it's like to be a computer. Oh, you mean the minds of computers? Yeah, in the mind of a computer, what, what's going on? You know, from the time it starts up, to the time it shuts down, it's kind of like a human life. It, it records a certain amount of stuff in memory. It, um, it has certain views about what's happening. And I, I was realizing it's kind of shockingly similar. What, uh, even a today's computer, I mean, forget, you know, future AGI, you know, whatever it is, ideas, even today's computer, when you start thinking about what is its inner life, sure. I, I find it surprisingly similar. And it, it's, it's sort of interesting to try and see how that. Yeah, well, I'm sort of encouraged by the fact that panpsychism in some form or another is becoming more acceptable. So that, uh... well, yes, I mean, this is, I don't really understand that. I mean, you know, what I've long claimed from this principle of computational equivalence is that sort of everything computes. Okay, so then if we're conscious, then everything else would be conscious. Because That's of... right. But what I realized recently is that our consciousness is not arbitrary computation. Our consciousness requires this thing about persistence through time is a critical fact about our mm -hmm. consciousness. And that fact is what leads us to believe in the laws of physics that we believe in and so on. So in other words, what the surprise to me is that consciousness is a step down from general computation, not a step up. So, you know, which I think is the opposite of what many people have believed about that, that situation. I think we are, we are not the general Rouliad. We are merely you know, observers of slices of the Rouliad with very specific characteristics. Yeah, well, I can't understand all of this, but the little that I do is fascinating. So uh, it's wonderful that you're bubbling with new ideas. Right, uh, we can keep bubbling for a long time, but we should wrap up. And I, I thanks very much. It was a very interesting conversation. I learned it's all kinds of- It's been a great pleasure, Stephen. All, all kinds of things. All right, well, great. Nice to, nice to see you. And um, I'm Likewise. going to, okay, we, we should probably- um, uh, bye to everybody on the live stream here. Um.